Leopard of Cries of the Nation. We're not sure yet. Uh, and I was thinking about this, Tiff. I was thinking Cries of the Nation can be like the call card for uh, what we're going to do, you know, when we're doing streams. But I was thinking about the Cries of the Nation project because I want to pull a bunch of things out. And I know that you've been coming to me. We've, we've been talking about doing this about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's so much that needs to come out. There are so many things that need to be addressed. And I think we're on the same page. I, I often say this, that we uh, need to really uh, pay attention to that African proverb that says, if there is no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. We spend a lot of time talking about white supremacy. We spend yeah. a lot of time talking about uh, the white racial caste system and racism and all of that. And we spend uh, in an inadequate amount of time talking about the enemy within, uh, the damage we do to ourselves, the things that make us vulnerable to the system, uh, broken families, uh, absent fathers, uh, uh, toxic mothers, all of these things where we got babies that we see dying on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We just had a conversation via text message about these babies in Houston where this woman and her bar friend left them abandoned for an entire year. Yes. And, you know, it happened. And in, in part of the reason it happened is because there's no community. And so what we want to do is we want to bring out to the forefront uh, the cries of the voiceless, uh, the people who don't get to say anything and have it actually heard. There's a woman in uh, Ferguson right now that I'm working with that I'm actually going to have a conversation with tomorrow and maybe interview depending on uh, where her mental health is at because right now she's really, you know, really struggling. Her, her, uh, we talk about cops killing black men. Mm -hmm. We don't talk enough about black boys killing black boys. And, you know, I'm the one that wrote several different academic papers to de uh, debunk the black on black crime myth. Now, so I, I, I'm not selling black on black crime myth in the sense that there's some ph uh, phenomenon where blacks just love killing blacks without acknowledging that 84% of white people that get murdered, get murdered by other white people. Now, right. if we want to talk about it in that context, mm -hmm. then we can talk about uh, black on black crime. But if we're just going to act like it only happens to black people, then we, we're taking the proximity equation out of the fact. But there are still some unnecessary stuff happening in the community. This isn't all somebody got in a fight. This is like literally we don't have a sense of self-awareness, of self-worth and self-love to care enough about ourselves. And it's a dangerous thing when a person doesn't care about themselves. There's absolutely nothing to stop them from harming you if they see you as a threat in any way. And so we have to get to that. Today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest elephants in the room. There is nothing no one wants to talk about, but something that's so prevalent in my practice that I literally have to detox every week with my own freaking therapist. And, and it's crazy. I mean, I've got women that I counsel and men, but when I have some women in their 60s still haven't gotten over this. And so, you know, and, and here I am, I'm trying to help them finally get, they get to me late in the, in the game, but I got to help them in, 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 in it, how many times they come to me for something else and we start pulling them layers back. And there it is. So we're talking about incest today. And I'm going to allow you to define incest because like we stated before we got on, incest is defined in many different ways. And we think we need for everyone to understand it in the broader sense, in the uh, totality of it. And so can you, you take it from there and then we'll kind of talk about what we saw this week that prompted this first episode? Um, so, well, incest, when we talk about incest, um, usually we are talking about sexual activity between family members. Um, it could be uh, 
father and a daughter, brother and a sister, stuff like that. But in a broader sense, um, incest is sexual activity with anyone you're closely related to. So that's when we start getting into sex with step parents, um, people that have married into the family. That's also that their family as well. Right. So it can be defined, you know, as people that you're closely related with. Right. So, um, of course, incest, rape, molestation, all of these things are closely related. Um, usually when we talk about one, we end up talking about the other. Um, so this week, I think what, what prompted this whole conversation was a Facebook post. Someone sent me the post and I really could not understand it, you know, on the surface because it was really strange. There was a picture of five women. And um, I think that the the words on it were something like, you know, my dad and all his girls or, you know, something about we are really family or really sisters, you know, something, you know. So as I started reading them, because I'm like, you know, why is somebody tagging me in this? And they said, hey, you need to read this. And when I started reading, I was getting an idea of what was going on, not a clear idea because it wasn't very clear at first, but it seems that the father um, was actually the grandfather to the young lady that made the post. So he had actually, uh, she was the product of him and his own daughter, which was the oldest daughter, um, being in a sexual relationship for a number of years. Um, the young lady also alleged that there was another sister that had also had a child with the father. Now, I did reach out to her <laughs> to try to verify and confirm because the post was all over the place. Um, I like to try to get as many facts as I can when I'm talking about a particular subject or whatever. You know, that's just my background. I like to get the facts first so that we don't have to go on assumptions or, you know, myths or anything like that. Um, I did reach out to her because I wanted to sort of find out because there was something on the post. Somebody was saying something like, no, I, you know, family, um, of course, was chiming in. Somebody said, no, the other sister does not have a child by the father. This child has her own father. And so it was just a big mess. Um, and it just. It 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 made me think about uh, instances of rape and molestation and incest that as a black community, we just push it, push it under the rug. We sweep it away. This is something that we don't want to talk about. And it's something that needs to be talked about. Even on her own post, um, there were some people that did not believe her. Now, I will say that um, we don't know if any of this is true. It's all speculation at this point because we have not spoken to this young lady. I have not spoken to her. But uh, either way, it's a it's a worthy subject and topic that we need to address because it goes on more than we would care to admit. Right, and right, right. I think the conversation needs to be opened up so that we can find out. I, I, I have some ideas, but I would like to know uh, the ideas of other people find out why maybe we can find out, um, you know, how, how we can put a stop to this and also how we can, uh, start healing the people that are affected by things like this. You know, it, like I said, you know, it's very, I have friends. I have a, a lot of friends that are, are women, of course, because I'm a woman. But um, it was very odd to me that the more uh, I spoke with women, the more I found out that, you know, the majority of the women had been either sexually assaulted as a child, raped or something. I just thought that that just blew my mind because I've never been raped. I've never been sexually assaulted. But everybody else that I knew had been, almost everybody else. And it was right. just, it was just crazy to me. Right. So it was an eye opener to me. And I think that um, there 
is a small percentage of people like myself that are that were not i'm aware now but maybe are still not aware of how often all of these things happen within the community they are like really green to it so that's another reason we need to talk about it okay well well let's 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 add some context so we can sort of give an idea of what we're looking at in way of numbers in way of of, of some sort of percentage to give some reality to it and, and before I do that, I want to go back and tie up a loose end where you were talking about the expansive definition of uh, incest. And you said, OK, you have the biological or genetic incest where you share the same bloodline. And so that we know for a fact that in close, in real, true close relation genetically, it can come with physiological or genetic implications uh, at birth, meaning that you can actually procreate and create a child with birth defects. Right. Okay. Uh, but, you know, normally those risks go down roughly around second cousin, third cousin on down. But any mm -hmm. anybody within that first filial strain, father, brother, uncle, all that stuff, you know, you're running a chance. But there's also outside of the uh, genetic or uh, bi uh, biological incest, there's spiritual incest, emotional incest, and mental incest that can happen with anyone who is primarily in a position of relation that would normally be considered off limit. So if you have someone that's close to the family and maybe not a real uncle, but a married uncle mm -hmm. or someone who is real close to dad, who has a role of an uncle mm -hmm. uh, or someone who is a godfather. And we saw that with the young lady who ended up marrying right. her mom's right. aunt who right. after breaking up with her mom took on the role of her godfather who down the line at 61 years old finally marries her when she's 18 after having fathered I think at least two kids with her. <laughs> and so to me, that's incest. That's incest because the psychological components in that is going to leave her scarred. The children are going to be scarred. The processing of that is almost impossible. You know, uh, and we go back to this particular instance, and then we're going to get to the numbers where we talk about this young lady who put this out there. And it wasn't so much what she put out. I shared it because I said, this is a conversation that we need to have. What triggered me and made me reach out to you was the responses I got both on the thread and in my inbox immediately after posting it. One woman comes on and said, well, I found my ex-husband in bed with his biological daughter, which wasn't my biological daughter. But then I found out that that relationship had been going on for years. And then on top of that, we have a 10 year old son together who's now uh, definitely in need of therapy. So now those, these are two people who you know, weren't actually directly a part of incest, but have been negatively affected by uh, incest. And now you've got a son whose sister is sleeping with his daddy wow. and he's got a process, but in not, not let's move forward to the young lady who posted this with these pictures. Now she's the, what she did. If I remember correctly, that the first picture, the pictures were numbered. Right. And on the first picture, she said, this is big sis. Mm -hmm. Also mom. <laughs> All right. So like, okay, wow. And then she goes, number two is the mother of number five. Mm -hmm. Okay, now from what I gather, number five never came in and responded to that, neither did number two. But somebody else in the family came in and said it wasn't true. Okay, so I think that Big Sis was, was uh, the mom, was the mother to number five, and she was number five. And the right. second one was number two, which was probably the second oldest, was the mother to number six. Right. Um, so, but people were saying that number six was not the right. father's child. I right. did see that. that. But, but, but let's go back and just look at this dynamic because I saw this growing up more than one time in the neighborhood, in the community. You have a child who is born to a mother who happens to be their sister. Now, the dynamic of trying to understand that it's virtually impossible because we don't have a social structure within the acceptable norm to justify or explain it. How can I be my outside of adoption? Because through adoption, I became 
uh, my grandmother's brother because her parents adopted me. But that was through no sexual relation, no procreation, no reproduction. It was a legal act that put me in a better situation. And we still performed as if I was still her grandson and still my mom was still my mom on down the line. I was just being real by my grandparents. It wasn't like I behaved like my grandmother's brother. But, you know, but 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 in a sense where now you are being basically parented by someone who is both your sister and your mother um, and your dad is also your granddad. And you're trying to you're trying to process that. OK, so that's a problem. Now you deal with the trauma of it. Because psychologically, there are implications. It cannot not be. It's not a social, natural social construct. But so the mind struggles to make sense of it. And while it will eventually be normalized as a means of survival, it still has created a toxic, uh, a toxic environment in the mind, but also uh, a problem with natural function. So in other words, you're sitting there and you're trying to make sense of life in a place that doesn't make sense. And it leaves you bruised. It leaves you scarred. It leaves you in a place of perpetual dysfunction. And now you've got to process it in a way that at some point in life, you can have a regular relationship. But see how I view men, if I'm a female, that's a part of that, how I view men from that point on, it's going to be skewed because everything is going to be seen through the lens in which I view my father. Hmm. How I trust men is going to be determined by how I view my father. Why? Because my father is supposed to be the person that establishes my relationships from point, from, from day one through, the, through my life on how I deal with men as a female. How I deal with men is going to be based on how I view my father. It's period. You know, if normally if father wasn't crap, you're going to struggle to get through relationships until you develop a sense of self-worth outside of dad. Uh, however that's done, some people discover it in themselves. Some people are lucky to find somebody that eventually comes on, sees something in them and treats them in a way they've never been treated before. And eventually they discover themselves. But something has to happen to shift that paradigm or you will consistently draw to you people who was, were, were just like that. And so that's a problem. So there's going to be this perpetual dysfunction within the family. All right. Then there's going to be this distrust. And here's the problem. The one who normally outs the family gets ostracized yeah <laughs> okay the one who sits up and actually exposes the secret which is a part of what's necessary in order to put a stop to it as well as for them to heal we need to acknowledge this mess in our family nobody wants to do that that goes back to silent condemnation silent condemnation is uh condoning something by way of silence in other words i'm not saying it's okay but i ain't saying nothing about it mm -hmm. i know it's happening but I'm, they ain't, I'm not getting involved in it. And it also goes back to, um, I don't want to say that it's, it's something that happens in our culture, but it's something that happens in our culture. Um, when we think about, <laughs> it, it happens in our culture. We are basically uh, indoctrinated or trained to uh, protect the family and not expose the family. We're, we're not supposed to expose. We're, when we expose the family, we are doing harm uh, to the family. We hear it all the time growing up. And it's not, it, it, it is not always concerning something as detrimental as incest or rape or molestation inside of the family. But we, I'm, I'm sure, you know, most black people have heard, hey, what happens in this house stays in this house. It's, it's, that's just how it is. Well, that, go, that goes all the way back to slavery. You have to understand that a great deal of the dynamic is what we've seen where tra trauma has been passed down by way. You have epigenetic uh, transmission of trauma where literally it's passed down through genetic means. You have uh, social learning theory that perpetuates trauma through behavior, but you also have trauma passed down by way of fear. And how that goes is back in the times of slavery, the most vulnerable person on the plantation was the man. The woman could negotiate with her means, if you know what I mean. Uh, she had a way of getting around and getting what she wanted if she wanted to. But the man and, and, and the, the man, and even to the little boy, there was this fear 
that he could be harmed because that that was often the case. So that was this idea of protecting. So nobody said anything. Nobody told anything. Everybody protected the man. The man was strong in body, but weak in spirit and weak, weak, weak in mind. And so he tended not to be able to function and move. No, you got to remember, we're talking about a time where families weren't allowed allowed to actually have rights as families. Now, if you go to somewhere like Brazil, where slavery existed, but they had rights, their marriages were respected. They could buy themselves consistently out of it. It wasn't some far-fetched idea. They could negotiate their their means of freedom and they had the right and their, their rights as human beings were respected. We were chattel. We had no human rights. Marriage was not respected, and often men procreated with these uh, women on the plantation, many times because master had chose the mates to create the strongest, the biggest uh, of each. And so it wasn't even a mate of his choosing. It was, hey, go in there and sire me some more slaves. And so this is what these guys did. And then if they did start to bond, they were sold off. The one thing that was not allowed was men bonding with their progeny. So what would happen is either the child would be sold off or the man would be sold off, depending on what was most valuable. So there was never this opportunity to bond on a regular basis, which is amazing seeing how almost immediately after slavery, the black nuclear family took hold. Uh, but it took hold with some weight. Uh, and part of the weight is... We can't expose, especially in a patriarchal society where in, in the beginning, most men were working and most women weren't. So what, what does that mean? He's the provider. And if he's the provider and he gets in trouble, who's going to take care of us? Right. It, that, it, that came with implications. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Whole another day, I do believe. Uh, I, I think that when you brought up slavery, it's very appropriate um, for this conversation um, because I, I remember reading an article in the LA Times, and um, this woman, her her name was C.C. Norwood. Um, she's a counselor out of Ohio, and she was talking about her experience with uh, incest and. Uh, molestation and what she said was we we take a history for example when we speak about slavery and by uh black men being you know the most vulnerable and we also take the historical instances of black men being falsely accused by white women of rape and you know whatever else so what we have today is we have a reluctance of, you know, saying, well, you know, a person that looks like me, we are in protection mode, especially black women. Um, like, no, I don't want to do this because historically they have been uh, falsely accused and, you know, killed because <laughs> of, of a lie. So we are in protection mode. Even when you know we know that it's true that this is the person, the person that looks like me, my uncle did this, uh, my my brother did this. We are still in in, in protection mode, and it, it's you know that's women operate like that. I think the most. Um, there's also well, I, I don't want to say the most. I don't want to say the most because <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say the most. But there's a, there's a different dynamic. Women do it. Because number one, it's in their nature to protect. Right. It, it, it simply is. That's a maternal instinct. Even though it's a grown man, it's a maternal instinct to protect. Uh, and they're not just protecting the man, they're protecting the family. And you got to understand the role that the woman has played in that throughout history here in the U.S. The black woman specifically has played in protecting the home. Um, and to many times to her detriment. It's a bunch of women. We love to talk about how long grandma and grandpa stayed married, but we don't really understand what grandma and grandpa did and what, what, what happened and how that marriage went because that was kept away from most of us. And that you had to be really on the inside of things or just very astute and aware to realize that 
a lot of those relationships were unhealthy. And unhappy. And, and, and unhappy, and, just to keep it real, and unhappy. Yeah. I hate to see, you know, all these memes all over social media talking about where are the relationships like grandma and grandpa. Uh, number one, back when grandma and grandpa were together, uh, grandma could not own anything. All of her value was attached to her husband. So she she was really probably under duress. <laughs> I mean, in many instances, in many instances. And so we've got this. And I was on my way, the way I normally usually do, which is the long way around the way or back around the way to actually provide context. That's just how I am. People on this channel know that. But it all started with me about 20 years ago. I was working with some clients. And that was about a year period where I actually started to catch a pattern that I hadn't noticed before, but when I thought after I noticed it and started to look back, it was there, but I was just too much into too many other things, but I was really getting into uh, this thing and I was working with uh, a lot of females and I started to notice a pattern. At a very, very, very high number for me, uh, I'm talking to probably eight Okay, so I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? How is it now? Okay, now it's good. I'm not sure. Every time. No, I can't hear you. You can't. You can't hear me. Okay, so let me see. Okay, my mic is not muted. Not yeah. I don't. I've lost you. Hold on one second. Let me check something. Okay. Okay. I see what's going on. Hold on. Let's see. All right, there we go. Woo! There Thank we go. You know? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. Woo! Yeah, that was a loud, loud buzzing. <laughs> okay. Everybody, sorry about that. We're still getting it clear. Can you guys hear us now? Let us know. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and finish where I was starting. So, back 20 years ago, I'm, I'm looking at this and I started to realize there are an extreme, that's an extremely high number of black females who have instances of childhood sexual abuse. 
So I contact another therapist uh, who uh, I ask, is it just me? This is the exact question. Is it just me? You know, or maybe every every woman who's ever been molested decided to pick me because I'm getting I'm getting this high uh, high number of women who have suffered from. And he said, no, I got the same thing. So then I start looking for empirical data on it. At the time, it wasn't a whole lot, but I started to emerge. And then there that that that, that were these studies, and on the very radical and liberal side. As many, the study says, many sixty percent of Black women have right. been molested under the age of eighteen. Yeah, before uh, they reach eighteen, right? 16. Right before the, before before reaching the age of eighteen, mm -hmm. and on the very conservative end, it was forty percent. So even if you say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna move out all this, we're not gonna take out we we're gonna take the most conservative figures. We're talking about almost half, and that's very conservative. The liberal side, which is more representative of what I was experience, experiencing, is, okay, now here we go. Something's wrong with this. And so what this, these are the numbers we're talking about. Now, all of this is an incest. You know, some of this is outside people. But in most instances, when it's childhood sexual abuse, it's someone the family knows. Mm -hmm. So it's still a dynamic of someone I should have been able to trust violated me. And then what happens is because there's no outlet, because you can't go to anyone, because no one wants to know. And and I've been to family reunions where everybody's talking about, don't let them children go over there by Larry. Why in the hell has Larry got space at the damn family reunion, first of all? Right. Why hasn't daddy and uncle so and so, -and -so tightened Larry's ass up? Why is Larry more protected than the children that he violated? Okay, and you know I'm passionate about this because my wife is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. So, you know, that story, you know, and, and, and there's a darkness to that side that goes beyond her in, the, in her family. And, you know, luckily she decided to fight. She decided she was going to be a survivor. She was going to thrive. That's how I met her. She was one of the women that came to me. And like, you know, we worked together. She went on her way and eventually we came across each other again. And I decided, man, I, I'm, I, that's who I want to be with. And I, you know, I snatched her up. But this thing is real. And so when I see something like that, and then like, for instance, like I said, you know, I'm sitting up and I post this thing the other day. I shared, matter of fact, I didn't post it. I shared what you posted. Mm -hmm. And immediately my inbox starts ringing. Well, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what happened. And I'm like, okay. And then, of course, my heart goes, how are we going to help all these people? Because there's got to be a healing. And see, when we stop children from telling us and we stop the process of protecting them, and we protect them and protect the uh, perpetrator or the offender, and we ostracize them for wanting to be heard and wanting to be protected, we further traumatize them. Right. And because we have this, uh, we, we have this phenomenon in our community as well, uh, where we don't believe the, the women and girls. We, we, we just don't believe them. And so, um, Sometimes where they are believed, they'll get blamed for whatever happened to them. I see it, I see it all of the time. Hey, we, we see it, we we see it in on social media when we talk about these uh high profile celebrities or whatever. Um, with if, if we get to talking about R. Kelly, and I don't want to talk about him, but he's just such a perfect example. Um, you'll have somebody posts about him and you'll have a hundred comments uh, from someone saying that the girls were fast. They, you know, they knew what they were doing and so on and so on. I mean, that's, that's how we, that's how it is. We would rather look at a, a girl and say, well, you know, maybe it did happen, but what did you do? How were you dressed? How were you behaving around this grown man? 
that made him do this to you. So they, they call what, it being. Mm -hmm. She she was being fast. Right. And, 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 and here here's the thing. And uh, there's a question I want to get to, and I, I put it on the screen. The question I want to get to from someone who asked a question. But that's that idea that Victor Blaming. There are actually studies uh, that are tied into that, and it's uh, it's called AT. Uh, S, uh, A T uh, S A. It's uh, attitude towards sexual abuse a a in the home. And in the study, they found that over 90% of blacks definitely believe that there's a problem with an adult having sex right. with a minor. I think it was like 93% in that study. I've read that study about 93%. Okay. So we know, we know, we know it's wrong. We know what. That same study also pointed out that there's a large percentage, depending on age, gender, and and geographical environment, that will tend to be a victim blamer. Mm -hmm. That'll sit up and say, "What did you do?" And um, and then you know, there's gender biases. On now, if it's a girl being molested versus a boy being molested, all these different things. Who did the molesting? If it's a woman doing the molesting, you know, or being molested, whatever. There are all these different variables. So then, there's a varied weight of protection. There's a varied weight of response. Ninety-three percent of us know better, mm -hmm. but very few of us are going to act. In behalf of those. Now, the question was, do you think it's easier to tell ourselves the children are lying? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, that that leaves absolutely no count, accountability. All I got to do is say. Do anything. If you just say, hey, shut up. You're telling a lie. Get out of my face. There's nothing else that needs to, to come after that. You 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 solve the problem right there. Just get right. out of my face. You're lying. I, this is not true. So you don't have to put in the work. You don't have to, um, you don't have to look, you don't have to deal with, with the problem head on. You don't, you don't even have to really acknowledge it. And, and, and I've got clients who was the mother whose child was being molested and knew and didn't have the strength at the time or whatever. And I'm not talking about one or two people. And now they're in this place where this heavy guilt is on them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're trying to find a way to reconcile. They're trying to find a way to now take responsibility. And so I get to get it and hear it from every angle. Now, and yeah, so who, who wants to um, who wants to say that my mate, the, the person that I'm with, the person that I have chosen to possibly spend the rest of my life with, who wants to really sit down and give any thought to this person may be doing something to my child or my own child's father may be doing something to, you know, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. It, it, you know, well, I mean, psychologically, it, 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 it puts you in a position that you're probably not prepared to be put in because the first thing you should end up saying, I brought this person into this situation. I, I, and then if it's biologically their child, you know, then, then, then but then you got to understand that, 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 that there's a bunch of different emotional and psychological processes taking place. OK, you've got the maternal response. I need to protect my baby. Mm -hmm. But you also have the self-concept in, in duress. Here's how the self-concept is in duress. My a uh, great if I'm with a man as a female, if I'm with a man as a female, and that's going to be I don't care how self confident I am, I don't know, how, I don't care how much I love myself. Uh, a, a significant part of my value is tied into the fact that this man loves me. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't sexy enough, that I wasn't exciting enough. That there's something lacking in me that you chose our baby, or in the sense that it's not his biological, it's his stepdaughter. That you came into my world, were you coming into my world just to get at my daughter? Mm -hmm. Did you ever even love me? All of that stuff is being processed in the in that moment, 
And what should seem like to the rational person, an easy decision, I'm finna blow your brains out. It's not that easy of a decision because once I blow your brains out, now I got to deal with the fact that everything I've lived for the past however many years was a lie. Right. Who am I really? And then, you know, so the easy thing to do is to sit up and say, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and don't you tell nobody that. Don't you go around telling nobody that. And literally the fight now is on to where you got a child not feeling safe in an environment and now you're getting into adverse childhood experiences. And, and we are mainly focusing on, because this, this is what prompted um, this discussion, father and daughter. Uh, but there's instances with brother and sister. I read a story where, you know, the brother had been molesting the little sister, you know, incest because they are sister and brother. And, um, it was found out the mother told the father and the father killed the son. And uh, the mother was devastated. She, you know, hey, why? She, you know, she was put in a position to where, what do I do? Because I think that she testified against her husband. I'm not sure, you know, how much, I think he did go to jail or something, but she, you know, she did not want her son harmed. The father said exactly what one of the people just put in, in the questions that the daughter would have to live with that for the rest of her life. He just not could not see any uh, redemption for that. Now, I'm not sure if um, that extreme was the right extreme being that these were both uh, this man's children or whatever. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I. I cannot speak to what was on his mind. But um, I want to say that the person that I am, um, people that do things to children, uh, pedophiles. Now, I just don't believe that they can be rehabilitated. <laughs> but that that may be a whole different discussion for another day as well. But I don't. I don't believe. Um, no, I, I. I think somebody else said that too, and it may have been the same person. Uh, we're talking about a sickness. Anytime that you move in that, that mindset, that is not a normal behavior. Instinctively, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, is that normal? So when you start talking about that type of behavior, you're talking about a sickness. Now, you got a number of different sickness, well, two primary sicknesses that impact the youth. They are pedophilia and ephebophilia. Most uh, ephebophiliacs are wrongfully labeled pedophiles. But a great deal of incest happens from the ephebophilia family. Pedophiles are people who are sexually attracted to prepubescent children, children who have not developed at all yet. They are babies. They look like little kids. Those are pedophiles. You know, so you normally talk to someone 11 and under. Okay. Ephebophiles, ephebophiles, or, or, excuse me, ephebophiles are those who are attracted to prospubescent, developing, sexually developed children. So they have the same thing as a woman. They haven't developed mentally and emotionally. So they see that and they are attracted to it for whatever reason. And that's where they're sexually aroused at. Again, that's a sickness. Now, there are some that will order that, well, in certain times, that was acceptable. Well, the thing is, environmental situations, cultural situations, historical situations. Well, when everybody was, life expectancy was 15, I guess so. You know, if, you, you yeah. know, the, but, but, but we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago before that, since that was, and that was never an issue in Africa. That was a European reality. Right, and again, but people, but people, people will argue that it was, that it was acceptable everywhere they will this is why we have such broad definitions for things like incest because they'll argue history with you and say okay this is not incest because in this culture and during this time this was acceptable we could do this we could do this. yeah you know, you know hey you know, sarah was abraham's you know half sister mm, yeah <laughs> so yeah I mean, they'll, hey. use, they'll use this stuff to justify right uh the behaviors 
Oh, you know, I, I, I've had people make the argument, well, well, uh, after Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, well, you know, and, and, and whatever else, how it happened, well, number one is they had more than Cain and Abel, if you are reading the Bible. And we put that disclaimer. If you're reading the Bible, there are more than Cain and Abel, <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, because the only ones supposedly created from the hand of God were those two. So they procreated, and and uh, so they asked, you know, well, well, okay, well, how did they get more kids? If, if they they're the only ones that had kids, how did more people get here? Okay, so that's what you get for going in there and doing them Bible stories, first of all. Okay, and and what we're talking about is the difference between a point in time and survival, and the development of a species, and the evolution of a species, and you have to understand at a certain point in time. The evolution of the species started to understand and behave in a certain way and understood certain things. And then there became an, uh, an understanding that that was a responsibility of the adults in the species to protect the youth in the species because the youth became the future. And everything is what? About survival of the species. Well, if you keep harming, psychologically harming the youth, eventually they're going to destroy themselves. It may take several generations of it, but eventually it's going to turn on itself. And you're going to have complete antinomianism, no structure, no organization, no way to order anything because of a decision that was outside of what was necessary. So you evolve for the sake for the sake of survival. Initially, what was taking place way back, however many million years it took place when there were two people that came from whatever and uh, four people or six people, however it merged, how many merged. What happened back then was survival. And then the things, as things evolve, things change. We're at a point now where babies are, the babies we're talking about, and I'm talking about to me, a baby, people get mad when I start calling 20 foot, 25 year olds babies. Mm -hmm. To me, I've lived in this world. And I look at the 25 year olds now, number one is they're not the 25 year olds that were back there when I was 25. Right. The ability to comprehend, the ability to provide for themselves, the ability to think, ability, they're not there. They've been dumbed down and we played a role in that too. They've right. been dumbed down. They've been put in a situation where they don't think critically, where everything that pops up on the screen, they think they are supposed to do. And these are the people we think have the maturity to go out and do something as significant as put themselves in a situation to procreate because that's what happens when you have sex. Okay, and now you bring another young child into a world where their parent isn't prepared to be an adult or even take care of themselves, but now entrusted with their safety. And you start getting situations like little Malaya several years ago that broke my heart that I still, so I have a picture it entrusted to idiots. Okay, and then you look, and that's so common. So it goes not, it goes, while we're talking about incest, it goes far beyond incest. It goes to the fact that we're not protecting babies. No, and and I mean, I think the, the most tragic part out of all of this is people know. <laughs> We, we just, we, we, we know not only do 93% of us feel that it's wrong and we know that it's wrong, we know. You, you can't tell me that the young lady that posted that, that, there were people chiming in saying, okay, people know in these families where this stuff is going on, there's always a group of people who knew, but nobody is saying anything. Right. Nobody is saying anything right. about incest about abuse about molestation nobody's saying anything about anything and we know it we are holding on to well, i mean we are the best at keeping secrets about stuff that we need to tell that, that's that silent condemnation that's that unwillingness to shake up what we believe to be a family structure which is highly toxic it's highly destructive it has no ability to project true, uh, true, powerful value system. We have to understand the whole structure of the family. You have to see the family as an institution. The family is one of the most powerful institutions in the world. Why? This is the place where two people who have the same value system come together, create new little humans 
in which they inculcate into their psyche the family value system and send them out to project their values into a part of the future they will not live to see. And they get to live based on those values, those beliefs, those principles. And when you sit up and you destroy the family system and you disrupt the family system, you, you basically compromise, you compromise it and it stops being functional for what it was designed to do. And that was to perpet perpetuate generations. It's a part of the survival process. If I sit up and I come from a family who sits up and believes that you protect your women, that you provide, that women are strong nurturers of the visions of their men, that all of these things come together and that both masculine energy and feminine energy need to be in the house to provide the balance necessary to make children feel loved and safe. All of these things. If I believe that, then I have to inculcate that into my children because what will happen is if I don't and I turn them over to a world that may not believe what I believe, they pick up things and they come back and all of a sudden being married isn't important. And for, if, if, if it's not important for you, then you have to understand the dynamics that come out because marriage isn't for everybody. But what I'm saying is when you procreate, especially as a black person in this country, the, the reality is about four to 5% are capable of procreating and creating a child and being able to financially provide for that child at a level that propels the child. I'm not talking about just feeding them and put a roof over their head. I'm talking about setting them up for the future where they don't start where you started. In other words, passing on a little generational wealth. Mm -hmm. The fact of a person, one, one parent doing that, it's about maybe four or 5% of us that are in a position right now to do that. So when you procreate, you already give a, t a, a you procreate with an understanding. I'm not going to be with this person. Now you've already put the child at jeopardy. Now it happens. So what do you do? But my, what you cannot do is have an environment where the kid isn't safe. And someone uh, had mentioned this earlier where they sit up and they said that there are women who literally have made a decision. They're going to stay single because they don't trust men coming around their kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I have a woman like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, again, I, I was, it, it was very long time ago. I, I really didn't understand, like, you know, because I, I didn't know um, that this was going on at the rate it was going on. Now, this was years ago. But, uh, yeah, I said, you know, we were talking and she said, well, these are my daughters. And she showed me some pictures of the daughters. Aren't they? They're beautiful. Yeah, they're beautiful. And um, she says, you know, I don't have anybody. It's just me and them. And I won't have anybody until they are, you know, grown and out of the house. And I said, why is that? And um, she says, because I don't have time to be dealing with any mess with my daughters and somebody, you know, that I've chosen to be in a relationship doing something to my daughters. And I said, hmm. I, I, I just remember like, hmm. oh, you know, OK, it wasn't until later that I gave it some thought. And I was like, OK, that's why, because it happens at such a <laughs> high percentage that you are literally taking that chance when you enter into a relationship and especially start cohabitating with a man, any man. Right. <laughs> with your children, with your daughters. And, 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 and as a person who has done this, you know, um, you know, walked into a relationship with children that weren't biologically mine and took them as mine. And I don't refer to them as step. I don't refer to them to any other thing than my babies. Um, and matter of fact, my oldest is not my biological. And we're the closest because we've been around each other the longest. She's 36 and we've been around each other. When I came into her mom's life, she was in diapers and she slept on my chest and she brought me in the fatherhood. She literally nursed me in the fatherhood before I ever had my own seed. And then her younger brothers were my first two. And then, I, you know, and I've done that a couple of other times, like Marion and I have a blended family. But the thing is, that makes it hard for me because never once have I looked at any of my daughters, biological or not, and saw anything but my babies that I'll die for. And I will have no problem doing a bunch of time 
behind one of them. So they, and the one thing they know, matter of fact, I was telling you about my 17 year old. When I came into her life, she was 11, 10, 10, 11, somewhere up in there. And she's grown into this unbelievable, beautiful, beautiful little girl. Uh, if she heard me say little girl, she would just die. But she's grown into the she she wants so bad to be grown right now. But I remember about 14 when she was about 14 and she was doing something. I say, if you don't stop, you're gonna make me get that belt. And she was like, psych. I said, Mary, they don't even take me serious. She said, No, since you've been here, you've been so protective over them, you won't let me hurt them. So they know that when you're around, you're that's the safest place to be. So when you start talking about popping them. They like, yeah, whatever, dude. And like, you know, that's still a respect. They do what I ask them to do and everything like that. But there's this understanding. When stuff gets rough, they come to me. You know, hey, this is happening, whatever. And I'm going to deal with it. You know, not that Mary is a softie by any way. She, she, she quite gangster. But, you know, uh, that's the thing I don't get. So when I sit up and I look and I go, this dude did what? And I'm true. My, I guess, and because I'm thinking from a rational place, the first place I start is even when I was in my 30s and I was watching some of these cats roll up on these high schools. You know what I'm talking about? Roll up on these high schools and got these little girls thinking, you mature for your age. That bull crap they run on them to make them gas their heads up. I'm going, do you know how thrown off a dude got to be and how messed up he got to be at 30 years old to have any freaking thing in common with a 16 or 17 year old? What in the hell is number one is what could she possibly what her conversation going to do? I mean, what could you possibly be talking to more than two minutes? Because I'm telling you right now, my teenagers, after two minutes, I'm like, I can't do it no more. Y'all need to get out of here. The conversation is so far off. What are you seeing outside of physical? But you can get the physical in a 30-something-year-old. What's wrong? What's wrong with you that the 37-year-old women don't want you? Well, then we start talking about something else called control. <laughs> yeah. Easy to manipulate. Easy to control. Very no pushback. Right. Women. So then we're getting into, now we're getting into a conversation about uh, a feeling of inferiority and intimidation. And so you go with something that you're not intimidated by. And there are all these little driving factors, none of which justify the behavior. And I think that has to be the thing that we talk about the most. And before we get off of here, what I think that we have to talk about is this blaring need to heal that nobody's dealing with. Right. Because you have to talk about things when, when you choose to, to do therapy. You're going to be doing a lot of talking because you need to hear yourself say certain things so that you can heal from it. We don't want to hear uh, things that need to be said because it's right now, you know, in, in some people's minds, it's just too painful to hear those things. And we want we don't want to look at us and how we may be uh, implicated in some of the harm that's been done to other people. So um, the healing doesn't start until we start talking about it. Until we stop saying, no, this didn't happen. Well, you you were the cause and you know, you you're part of the blame. We have to start talking about it. it. These do not have to be, they shouldn't be taboo conversations. They are taboo um, because of the subject matter, I guess, but we should start having these conversations out in the open because this is something that's happening. It's 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 not, you know, uh something that happens every once in a while it happens a lot and it's been happening a lot and so we start healing when we start talking right and so i think that's the part that really i really look at okay if it's happened what are we going to do about it there are two elements that i look at prevention protection with three Prevention, protection, and healing. Prevention is a part of the protection, but protection also means that we are not going to allow it to happen. We're going to do something about it. But what happens when it does happen? We got to have healing. We've got to have a mechanism in place where people can walk in and be able to deal with some of, the, some of these things. And it's not just with incest. It's with abuse, period. Mm -hmm. it, it's with abuse. It's with neglect. And all of the trauma that comes down as a part of the family history. 
You need to deal with that in order to walk away from it and break free from it. You've got to acknowledge what it has done to you. You've got to be like you say, you got to be able to speak it. You got to be able to process it, categorize it. And if it's at a level of being traumatized, which in most instances, instances it is, then you've got to be able to integrate the traumatic memory. And what that is, and I'm going to say this and then I'm going to be done and you can close out. What, what when we talk about integrating traumatic memory. What are we saying? We're saying that when someone is actually traumatized by something, you can experience trauma and not be traumatized. Mm -hmm. You know, you can experience it, go through it and say, OK, you know, wow, that was crazy. And go on about your business. And it all depends where you are at the time emotionally. You know, just imagine that, say, this is the barrier for being down here is when you've fallen so low that you're traumatized by something. Being up here is wholly, completely healthy. Well, you go through life and things happen. Something happens here. You lose your mom. You go through a bout with cancer. You go through and you study getting close to this line. Well, if something really crazy happens right here, the chance of you being traumatized is high. But if you're up here, you're strong, you're prepared and all this here, the chance of being traumatized by a traumatic event, depending on the intensity, is less. But so it, not everybody is traumatized by the same thing. Right. But when a person is traumatized, what happens is there is a physical, emotion, spiritual and mental imprint that literally imprints itself in a way that doesn't time stamp it. When we have a recall, when we have a regular or what's known as a conventional memory, it's recall. You're recalling something in your past. It'll cause you to think about it. And if it's a good memory, you reminisce. If it's a bad memory, you may get a little melancholy or, or whatever. And you know, if, but if it's a bad memory and you get a little too melancholy, you turn it off. Well, with traumatic memory, it's not a recall, it's a relive. You literally are back when it happened. If it, you know, I've had uh, people that I've worked with say, I can smell this cologne. Hmm. I mean, literally, I can smell this cologne. You can see the hair standing up on their head, on their necks. Mm -hmm. You can see the goosebumps when they started. It's not a memory anymore. It's they're going, through, they're panicking. The anxiety is coming. It's going through, and they're living that, and they don't have any control over it. When it happens, how it's happened, it's hard to maintain relationships. It's hard to cultivate relationships. It's hard to sit up and go through day to day because any little thing, somebody wearing that cologne can walk by trigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you do that? You have to integrate that memory in a way that puts a time stamp on it. And when you put a time stamp on what happens, it now goes to something that happened in your past that you can recall but not have to relive. And so now you don't panic because the moment that it pops up, your brain automatically says that happened already. And so literally it changes things. That's the first place. You got a bunch of people cut, steady reliving something that's immensely horrible in their lives. Right. And, and, and they have not um, developed uh, the coping mechanisms to help them out of that loop. It's its just a loop. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. And they have to have uh, the tools to get themselves out of that, you know, and there's different tools for different people, depending on what type of uh, trauma the person has sustained. This is such a, a, a broad <laughs> topic and um, it's such an important topic that we would be talking like forever almost uh, trying to unravel all of the, the pieces to, to this puzzle. And um, I just, I, I, I think that the first thing, like I said, is to start having a conversation. Um, when we start talking about it, then we could identify things within the conversation that will tell us what the next step is. But we can't get to those steps unless we start talking about what's going on. We cannot keep um, we can't keep shooing away, you know, these the, uh, uh, subjects. Like, no, we, we don't want to talk about it. It's not a good time. This, you know, it is a good time. The good the time is now. We need to we need to do this. We need to address these problems. I mean, we are as a as a as a community, 
uh, and as a collective, we are we're stagnant. I don't care how people feel like we have advanced, and we have advanced in some areas. But look at the family structure; it's it's completely falling apart. It's in shambles um, because there are things that we will not, we refuse to discuss and acknowledge. And we have to start by having a conversation. Hopefully, um, with this segment, we'll tackle the hard subjects. Uh, this is just day one. Right. And, um, I'll have to get in my element, but I can tell y'all it's going to get down and dirty. <laughs> I've, al I've already warned them about you. They got the well-behaved version oh, yeah. of you today. And so I'm, I'm glad you behaved yourself because I literally stay on her about behaving. Not that it matters or she listens, but, you know, I stay on her. I want to close it out answering this question because I think that this is an important question and I have a simple answer for it and we're going to have to revisit it because we're going to talk about healing a lot. But it says, how can we build healthy marriages to raise our children when so many of us are damaged individuals? And that is we shouldn't be having children in relationships until we heal. Right. A lot of people go into relationships thinking the relationship will heal them. People are looking into relationships and salvation. First thing I, I, I learned, and one thing that Marion and I both understand is uh, it's not my responsibility to make her happy. And it's not her responsibility to make me happy. It's my responsibility to create an environment where she can pursue her happiness. And I can do the same within the confines of our understanding of the parameters of our relationship. In other words, I can't pursue because we have agreed to be in a monogamous relationship. I can't pursue anything happy outside of the relationship with someone else because that's violating the relationship. But I can go if I if making me happy means I want to go fishing. Then I've got an environment where when I get ready to go fishing, I ain't got here. Oh, my God. Where are you going fishing? You know, I'm gonna, you know, that right there. But her trying to figure out what can I do for him today to make him happy? will make her miserable. And so what we do is say, what do you want to do? And so there's compromise and all of that, but that comes from healthy people engaging. When you are not healthy, you coming into a situation and you, what you're actually doing is hoping that that relationship validates you. Right. And, and I'm just to chime in on the question and the answer that you gave, um, I think that this is something that needs to be taught in our community. We are, I'm not sure exactly what it is that we are being taught, but I know that we are not being taught that we need to be healthy individuals first um, before we start procreating, bringing children into the mix. Um, I know myself, I, I started having children young and there was no concept of, of there was some concept of some things, but not, I, I, I knew nothing about what it is that I would have to do and uh, what I would be tasked to do as a parent. Um, we make the mistake, it's people, I, I keep getting this, this term in my head uh, that people used to say to me mm -hmm. called hustling backwards. And basically that's what we're doing as black people with our families, we are hustling backwards. We are doing everything backwards. Nothing is in order. We having the children. We all messed up. We bring them in there. Then we we trying to find out on the back end. How do I fix myself? What? I mean, we we fix yourself now after you've had children or what? No, we we have to. And um, it's it's we we have to address us first, the brokenness within ourselves before we start introducing other people. Just like poverty. We, if you look, if you cannot afford the children, don't have the children. And that's, I'm not just talking about financially either, uh, because we'll throw around, well, hey, I take care, I can provide for all of these children, but how, 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 how much can you provide of yourself? How, you know, psychologically, how much can you provide to the children? So you have to be right before you start uh, bringing folks into your family mainly children. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is a great start uh, to Cries of a Nation. Uh, we're going to be back every Wednesday at the same time uh, so that you guys know when to tune in. So right now we have the normal stuff I do on a regular basis daily. We got 
Dr. Blanchard and myself on Saturdays with the teachers. And we're still trying to get Michael Jordan back on Thursdays for the Black Voice actual radio show, which actually started all of this. Uh, but like I said, that's my ace, my dude. But we're on two opposite sides of town. Uh, he's a very, very, very involved single father. Uh, so he's got his hands full. And so we're trying to work out the schematics of that at this particular point because we want to be full steam ahead when we go. Uh, but look at that. And those are the things we do. we're, we're in the process of creating programming. And uh, Tiff, and, Tiff and I go way back. Uh, I don't know if Tiff remembered it. Like when Tiff first became my friend on social media, we actually had a little Tiff behind Umar Johnson. And and like the person who was like the uh, nexus for us, like how Tiff got to my page was through her. I don't even think she's on social media. I haven't seen her in a while, but she would just say, hey, she's good people. She's just fine. She just feel. And the thing is, I don't judge people by disagreements. I judge people through observation and somebody doesn't have to agree with me for me to like them, you know. You uh, that thing that, that says iron sharpens iron, it doesn't just go for dudes. You know, my wife and I sharpen each other all the time. It's about people who can be honest and authentic with where they're at and what they feel. And they bring a real true desire for something that you agree on. So our agreement is we, we, we have children we're raising in the world that we want the world to be better for. Right. And Sometimes we're on the same page. Sometimes we not. And boy, she began my brothers, the blues. But most of the time that she's out there, she's out there with legitimate, you know, like it's hard to kind of look. Dude shoots five women because four of them tried to stop him from shooting his girlfriend. And I'm like, okay, how did I, I? And number one is, I ain't nothing I can say about that. But like, that's some messed up stuff you know, put him under the jail, put one in. Me, personally, and I got to be careful how I say this because, you know, as always on somebody on YouTube looking to uh, drop you off somewhere and get you in trouble. But I don't have any tolerance for anybody who harms the elderly, women, or children. I mean, no I, 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 don't, I don't believe in redemption. I don't believe in second chances. You harm the elderly, you harm women and children, then, you know, you know, that's my thing. To me, that's it. the code of conduct that I created on the site. That's in there. You simply don't do that. And I think it's up to black men. And I start to see that in some in places where. I don't get that. So I'm not going to even try to address it. If somebody just popped up with something long. Anyway, but long story short, that there's this thing. And then we also uh, got together on a business thing that she she initiated uh, on Facebook. We have a page over there that has grown to how many last time? You it's about 75,000 75, 75, people. 75,000 75, followers that are black entrepreneurs, black aspiring entrepreneurs trying to promote. And we're really trying to structure that at the time. And, you know, uh, it's crazy trying to keep up because both of us are also business owners. Right. And we've got our own thing going. So it's crazy, but we have a ball. And so I'm looking forward to doing this. We've been talking about doing this for two, about a year and a half now. Yeah. Uh, and so here we are finally. And so we're going to be back next week. Uh, not sure which one of the things on deck we have. We have several things on deck, so we're good for about a month for sure yeah. uh, with, with, with stuff we need to talk about. Uh, but I know there's something really heavy on Tiff's heart. Hopefully we can get that squared away and have that be the next thing uh, that we talk about. And if so, it's going to really be something deep because we need to deal with this issue as well. We're losing too many of our Black women that are simply going missing. And we're not doing anything about it. We're not taking it serious. And we went from five years ago, 64,000 black women missing to well, we're in the well into the seventies now of black women missing in America. And we need to address that issue. And so on that note, we're gonna get ready to get out of here. 
Uh, it's been great, Tiff. Thank everybody that stopped in. Uh, share this video. Leave your comments. Come back after the video stream closes and leave your comments in the in the uh, steady field for those people who don't check the chat comments. Do that. Uh, I'm checking out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day.